Um, it's absolutely about both. But when it comes to the tech companies, uh, I think if they provide new apps with screen time and bedtime and do you know how long you've been on your social media time, that's nice. Um, I interviewed some children recently who said it's really good to get that information, but it doesn't change anything that I do. So That was Professor Sonia Livingston. And in the show today, we're going to talk in depth about the relationship between children, caregivers, parents and technology. This is a really fascinating episode where we focus on the importance of trusting our children's judgment when it comes to how they use technology, what impact, if any, digital wellness tools have on children's behaviours, and also how we can all prepare for an increasingly digitised society. But first of all, welcome to the Digital Mindfulness Podcast. We bring together thought leaders from around the globe to bring you the latest trends and thinking in time well spent digital experiences. If you're new to the show, then the best place to find out more about us is to go to digitalmindfulness.net forward slash start here. There you'll find some required listening podcasts. And also on the website, you'll find hundreds of hours of content where we discuss everything from digital wellness to getting things done, digital resilience, habit forming products, technologies for the mind and much, much more. So enjoy this episode with Professor Sonia Livingston. Sonia, welcome to Digital Mindfulness. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today and I'm really looking forward to delving in more into the incredible work that you've been doing. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So Sonia, tell us a little bit about your background and in particular why you chose to focus on children and technology. Um, so I'm Sonia Livingstone. I'm a professor of social psychology at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And uh, my research for a long time has focused on children and young people and their use of um, changing media, digital media. And um, I've led a number of projects that have really tried to understand in a kind of holistic way what the... Um, what both the opportunities and the risks are for um, children of digital media and the role of parents and teachers and the wider society in um, guiding them and um, trying to ensure that really the best research uh, finds its way. Also to those who are worrying, who um, are trying to regulate, uh, who are trying to kind of give guidance to parents and so forth. And as part of that, I also... Um, run a blog called parenting.digital where I try to kind of make sure that the academic research reaches a wider audience. So would you say then Sonia that the research that you put out in general is more parent first that you look from the lens of the parent first or is it more balanced out and that we have also the perspective of the child in terms of this research? Um, I really try to work from the child's point of view first mm. and I increasingly work within a child rights framework. So I think um, what I like about the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the other kind of child rights um, uh, framework is that they, um, they take that kind of holistic approach of thinking about um, opportunities, benefits, risks, harms and so forth. But I, um, I have become aware in the last few years that parents are really anxious and um, their voices are also a bit lost in some of the wider debates and they're also often the ones that are um, the target of all this advice. So there's a lot of headlines that say parents are failing and not managing and a lot of educators saying it's the parents' fault for letting the kids use the screens unlimited and so on. So in the last few years I have been also trying to really listen to parents and understand why for them digital technologies are so scary and yet so attractive at the same time. So why would you say then that parents are feeling such anxiety about this? Is it because they're just getting a barrage of information from all sides or is there something else at play? I think it's a kind of perfect storm of um, complexity, innovation and um, just sheer visibility like when parents look back on their own childhoods 
there's a lot of commonalities between what their children experience. So they can they can kind of see that, you know, there's a bit more educational pressure, there's a bit more financial uncertainty perhaps, there's a bit more kind of um, uh, sense of social change, but the technology is the thing that really makes the difference for them. And they just don't have their bearings, therefore, on on you know that's this is how I was parented this is what happens to me happened to me what's right for my child so I think I think it's that but I do think societies are um putting a lot of pressure on parents to manage the the larger societal challenges so we do want children to um get educated to um uh, grow up and thrive in a world that we can't really imagine in 10 or 20 years and we expect parents to kind of manage a lot of pressures and I think they um, they're often worried about all kinds of things they don't articulate but because the digital technology kind of occupies the the space of anxiety and it kind of it acts like a lightning rod and it draws all the other anxieties they might have together so that the um the, the technology becomes the really visible thing that they have to manage now because it's like there in their in their face in front of their child's face um, pinging and calling them and you know making all of its um its kind of demands on 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 their children's time and on their time so they it it, it epitomizes the new it epitomizes the change I think this is absolutely fascinating and particularly everything that you're saying about um, the complexity problem and how that confuses a lot of people in this debate. But I'm wondering, is this the thing that really attracted you to this space? Uh, I think there are a number of reasons why uh, the question of, you know, how young people are engaging with digital technology has really drawn me. One is... uh, uh, maybe I could have done research in a, a kind of a safe and bounded and set area where people knew what they were talking about, but I'm fascinated by something that is changing and that is contested and that is a struggle for lots of people, not just parents and children, but also researchers who are arguing about terminology and about measures. And it's a struggle for um, regulators and policymakers who kind of don't know, you know, should they be turning to education or um or the law or um you know parenting advice or health or whatever it is so i i just find myself gravitating towards the space where society's having a big argument and right now it's children's screens mental health regulating the platforms that's like the controversy and my hope is that as a academic researcher you know research has something to put into the pot and help So the research canon on children and technology is absolutely enormous. There are so many research papers that have been published and are being published. But I'm wondering, over the time that you've been researching this area, what are the main milestones of change that you've seen over time? And what have we learned as a community? That's a great question. Um, How many hours do you have? Um... I think we have learned some things and we've also gained some bigger new questions. So I think we have learned um, as as kind of researchers in a way, we've learned to um, that we have to see the child in the round. We can't have people in one kind of department researching the risks because that will lead to a call for restriction. If we've got other people working, you know, in relation to educational opportunities, and that will lead to a call for more digital media. And, you know, they'll, they'll kind of head off in opposite directions unless we keep them together. I think we have learned um, a little slowly to listen more to children and their experiences, because we began by saying, okay, we're the adults, we know what is good for children. And there was a lot of um, kind of adult labels for risks, adult um, norms of how children should um, live, what looked what looked right. And we have really learned here because children can find their pleasures in surprising places and they um, 
can have some very creative views of technology and some often very kind of thoughtful approaches to their own management of their technology. And if we build on that, that's productive. And then I think we have um, uh, hope we have learned to stop panicking quite so much because basically um, children are okay. Basically, um, the digital is not the most important thing that is happening in their lives, though it's a fun thing and an interesting thing and sometimes a dangerous thing. But there's a lot else happening, so I think we're getting better at putting it in proportion. Um, but then where there's new things we don't know. Um, so the technology is changing. And right now, for example, um, I'm I, just as we before you called I was um, writing a paper about privacy and children's data and we didn't have that on the radar 10 years ago we thought cyberbullying, pornography educational opportunities participation we didn't ask anything about privacy in children but now with their data going in you know really complex places and being kind of tracked and monetized across the across their digital lives we really see that where their data goes is is like the the mediating force between what good it can bring and also what harms it can bring. Now, Sonia, out of the great body of work that you've produced, one of the things that I know you're working on currently is understanding how parents, caregivers, um, etc., how and children, how they all prepare for their impending digitized future. And of course, you're writing the paper now and you're writing the book also. But I wonder if there are any key learnings you can share with us. How are these different groups um, preparing for a digital future? Well, there's a lot of, yeah, it's it's really, really hard for anyone to imagine the future. Obvious, but true. Uh, And the very act of parenting is a preposterous notion really that you have a child who will be an adult in 20 years from now and if I ask you to describe the year 2038 that would be kind of hard and that's when you know today's babies will be grown up so um, what are people doing the, the parents and teachers are telling themselves one story that they really try to hang on to which is I know my values I know what um, is important to me. In the long run, the continuity is always bigger than the changes, and they try to kind of hang on to that and bring up a decent human being. I think most parents have that ambition. Um, Then there's a sense that everything is changing and uncertain, so what I need to bring up, what I need of a child is um, flexibility, multiple skills, and a kind of resilience to the unknown. And so there's quite a lot of them, um, and perhaps, you know, more, more critically, more negatively, um, a sense that it's going to be a competition and not everyone is going to survive. And you've got to kind of do your very best to make your, yes, you want them to be a decent human being, but you kind of also want them to survive in this kind of rather cutthroat competitive world. So there's a lot of trying to skill up children in all directions and to try to kind of identify you know, what's the next skill they might need, whether it's coding or um, creative production or becoming a YouTuber or, you know, whatever it is, they kind of, (laughs) becoming a podcaster, you know, they kind of want their child to make sure that they've got their foot on the right, um, the right pathway. Um, And then there's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty tough. I think for me, I'm really interested in the angle that you're taking in that you say that children are fine online and that we should perhaps worry less about them. Because as parents, I think we we naturally feel that we should, um, to an extent, control and definitely protect children um, when they are in open spaces. And we can definitely consider the web the online realm as an open space. But what you're saying is that actually we should be more comfortable in trusting our children's judgment and that to do so would not only be preferable for the child, but also beneficial for them as well. 
Well, I think mostly it's harmless and beneficial. In fact, I think mostly it is really, really vital that in this scary, changing world, we focus on um, empowering children as agents, agents of their own lives and agents Mm. even of their own mistakes because they have got to learn. But, you know, the internet is, the digital is a particularly harsh world. And things can happen really fast. And there's a lot of very kind of extreme things that happen. So I, I, you know, I, what we, we, we want to kind of build the pathway where by children don't take all the steps at once and, you know, encounter everything at once. So, and so, and some children um, encounter harms and that terrifies parents. So it's, you know, and I, I know the, the, the kind of the road safety analogy is a, is a, old one but it still works you know you 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 first take your child on a small road and they learn to walk and they fall over and they pick themselves up and then you go to the park and then you let them cross the road and what's what and and eventually you know they're driving themselves around the 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 town but I think where I struggle with that analogy is a lot of parents aren't letting their children cross the road or out into the park or walk to school either so the the anxiety on parent side is really quite all encompassing and that's you know going back to my idea of a holistic approach because we're fearful of children everywhere they find the online world a space where they can really try to experiment and that could be their space and they want to push the boundaries and transgress there because we are getting anxious about letting them out of the house and going to so you know, children are going to find those spaces. And the more we hem them in and try to keep them control what they do, the more they will transgress and escape. And so we need another, we need another set of um, metaphors. And it's not about controlling, it's about guiding or empowering or, um, uh, you know, kind of supporting and being there, but not always in front of them, not always leading and containing what they do. I'm really interested to know, Sonia, your opinion of the developments in digital wellbeing recently, and particularly um, those companies which have now included lots of tools for exactly this purpose, and particularly focused on, I would say, young people and their use of technology. So tools to monitor screen time, to limit the amount of time or provide greater awareness on the amount of time that people are spending with their digital services. Do you think that these tools and moves like these are helpful from technology companies or do you think that it's perhaps better that children um, and caregivers that they develop these skills themselves so they're better able and more empowered to act on their own? Both. Um, It's absolutely about both but when it comes to the tech companies uh, I think if they provide new apps with screen time and bedtime and do you know how long you've been on your social media time, that's nice. Um, I interviewed some children recently who said it's really good to get that information, but it doesn't change anything that I do. So that's one thing to think about. But, you know, the companies, how can I put this? I, 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 I would love them to do some things. I think we need them as a society to do some things that might hurt the bottom line. And these things are all like family-friendly add-ons and parent um, marketing add-ons, which are great. Uh, but we need them to stop autoplay on YouTube. We need them to stop notifications on by default. So if you've updated your... Um, phone you don't have to go around turning everything off again because otherwise you're woken up in the middle of the night we need them to um, uh, think again about some of those recommender algorithms that kind of lock you into a bubble or take you into an ever more extreme and repetitive content so that we have kids who are watching unboxing videos all day long Um, because if you watch one then of course what you want is more um and these things might not maximize attention and they might not maximize eyeballs for the industry but they'd be better for our kids and so 
I think they have some pretty big profits over there. I think they could reduce some of those profits and to make a better society in the long run. Do you think then, Sonia, that um, the imperative to do this by the technology companies, do you think it's a moral imperative? Should they just do this because it's morally the right thing to do in society? Or are there financial upsides to building more tools like this? Yeah, we, 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 we just don't know. And um, so that's something else I would love the companies to do. So when they implement, um, okay, let's say they um, a new platform puts on autoplay. So you watch one video and you're going to get the next and so on. Surely they monitor, they know what what proportion of people therefore stay on and watch more and how long they do it for. And they know if they were to do an experiment of taking off the autoplay or putting the notifications off by default, they're surely monitoring how much benefit that brings. So, you know, we're researchers on the outside trying to guess which of these things would help children's well-being. But they're the ones in the position to do the experiments and find out and, you know, try the different permutations and combinations of uh, on, the, on the interface to see what, yeah. So, so why don't they, but they don't share that knowledge with us and they don't invite us in to kind of advise on which experiments might work or what, what measures of well-being and outcomes you'd want to take into account. Um, you know, so if I, if, if I put the question the other way around, so what, is, what does good look like? What does a, a happy child with a well-balanced life look like? We, we kind of know when we see them, but it's another thing to try to get the tech companies to measure it and then optimise their services for that rather than for maximum attention, maximum profit. One of the things that really interests me, Sonia, um, from the research that I've read and definitely from reading your work is the socioeconomic role that comes into play when we're talking about children and technology and particularly the extent to which um, children are using that. So I'm wondering if you can actually shed some light on whether there actually are differences um, when we're talking about different socioeconomic areas in the ways that children do use technology and the approaches that caregivers and parents give to that relationship. Are there any real differences? Huge. So if I can talk about my um, last book, which is called The Class, and it was um, I spent a, a year as an ethnographer with one class of 13-year-olds. So I'll take them as a kind of microcosm. Um, you know, I, I met the class. There they all were. It was in Britain, so they're all wearing their school uniform. They kind of all looked the same, and they were all very keen to talk about technology. And then we um, went home with them, looked at their past, their home lives, how they were, you know, organising their learning and their hobbies and so on. And they just all became so different. And so it was so important, social class, um, ethnicity, um, gender, and then a whole host of personal factors, which made, you know, one child sitting next to the, the, another really living in a, of course, overlapping lives, of course, lots of commonalities, but really lots of, lots of differences. So um, inequalities really matter. But beyond that, there are children who cope with the demands of life by finding a niche. They live in a, the, the computer game is their happy place and that's what they play and everything else is get through the day. And there are others who do all the social media because that's what's expected, but then they turn it off and they want to sit and play with their dog or their rabbit and chat to their little sister and, you know, as, as you know, twas ever thus. Um, and then there are others who want to be on the leading edge. Have you heard the new app? Are you on this new kind of social media yet? You know, we want to kind of be the pioneers in the new. You know, I had 30 kids, all different, divided by inequalities, but also shaping their own kind of social worlds. So scale that up to the country or the you know the world maybe. Um there were just lots and lots of ways of being a child in a digital world. And some of them we need to address because they're about inequalities. And some of them we need to say, yeah, 
kids are different. Uh, don't don't talk about them like they're all the same. Actually, and we forget. Very... We forget. We start talking about them all as if they're kids, all like the same, all on the latest, all doing the same thing. And I think if we could remind them and remind parents more often, um, you know, they're not all the same, and they may talk that talk, but there is space to be different and to find their own path. So talking about kids again as one big homogenous group, um, but through your research in general, have you found then that children are increasingly savvier about um, the impact of how they behave online and just particular important things like privacy, like the use of their data? Yeah, I think um, so. So kids are very keen to be in the know and to be up on the digital, and they kind of follow the latest. So they're listening very carefully to the adult conversations around them Mm. uh, and to some of the adult anxieties around them. Um, But they can only know, I would say two things. Firstly, they can kind of only know what's like understandable. So they can, any, um, whatever the options are on the app that they use, they know all the options because they can check them out. Who exactly can get in touch with them behind or through the app or where the company that owns the app sends their data and shares it, that's not really knowable to them. That's not really accessible. So they don't know and they're a bit anxious about it and they don't know how to find out. And then, yeah, so I think, you know, they, they, they can, and then what they don't know is what's coming. So they watch the science fiction films like the rest of us. They kind of know that we're all going to turn into cyborgs and become chipped and um, kind of tracked in many ways, but they don't really, yeah. So th- so this, so even though they're often more uh, knowledgeable than, than parents and teachers, that doesn't mean they know what's coming down the line or are ready for it. So for any parents listening to this, Sonia, what would you say then through all of the research that you've done are the most important things that they should um, really take away to help better help them prepare their children, other young people for a digitised life? Well, in a way, there's kind of one absolutely core thing, which is respect the voice of your child and listen to your child. And I know that's like so, so it seems so obvious. It's so hard often for parents to do. And I, because they're rushing around and because they think they kind of know the answer already and because they sometimes would rather believe their fear of what's happening than what their child is actually telling them. I think children are often quite cautious in the face of the new and they are um and this generation i don't know if this is true everywhere but this generation is actually uh, especially when they're younger is really they want to rely on their parents they want to turn to their parents for their knowledge and of course parents are not you know the digital ignoramuses that they used to be there so i think yeah listen to your child your child has got something to say your child has got something and encourage your child to feel that their kind of gut instinct about what's safe for them or what they're ready for or what's interesting for them is probably okay and it doesn't have to be the same as everybody else. I'm very keen that the parents who are trying to say you're not old enough for that yet or I want to kind of take care with you when you do this, they should feel empowered to do that Um, because lots of parents are trying to do that and they're just undermined if they feel everyone's got a mobile phone and they're only you know however old everyone's on this app they're not they're not the kids are different the parents should feel that they can kind of hold their own line but then the other the last thing I might say is you know have some fun with your child in the digital world find something you can enjoy together so it's not always a heavy-handed parent coming in and judging and a child inclined to kind of hide the fun because they don't want it taken away. Find something you can do together that's a pleasure and then find something offline that you can do that's a pleasure as well. I think that's really interesting and just to expand that last point, um, is that something again that you found um, in your work that the most successful or the happiest relationships were when um, digital activities were shared amongst the family. 
yeah, um, yes. Uh, and but even you know, even when there's a good relationship between the parent and the child, there's often a tendency to think the technology is something separate and they go and do their thing. And the phone, of course, makes it all worse because when it was on a computer screen, you could kind of mill around in front of the screen and share casually. And now it's harder when everyone's staring at a pretty small device. Um, but not all families are happy and not all parents have a lot of time to kind of play with their kid and not all kids are so willing to share. So I think then one of the difficulties is the technology can very quickly become the problem, like the presenting problem. And it becomes where the struggles are, which might have a completely different kind of origin or a complete, or the, the emotion might come from somewhere else, but it all gets sort of fixated onto the device. And, um, and then that becomes the, the point of uh, punishment, reward, control, freedom, you know, it's, it's, it's too, in, it's too intense. So take some of the, take some of the pressure away from the device. It's just the device, you know, chuck it away occasionally. <laughs> That's fantastic advice. Um, Sonia, so unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. But where can people find out more about you and your work and connect with you? Oh, that's a very nice question. Uh, well, everything is at um, sonialivingstone.net and at parenting.digital. So that's kind of me. I try to put it all there. You can follow me on Twitter. Parenting. Uh, S, who knows? Um, and uh, yeah, I'd be very happy if anyone wants to raise some questions or get in touch. Fantastic. Well, look, Sonia, thanks so much for spending time with us today and sharing just a little bit of your insights from the work that you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking me great questions. And uh, yeah, all Thank the best. You.